who is a VP IT and CIO. He's also served on the uh, IMS Global and Educause, and we are excited to have him here today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled. Um, I came down and um, what Georgia Tech is doing with your scalable advanced learning environments, I think is really at the forefront of uh, thinking in higher ed right now. And so uh, it was really impressive to me and I'd love to talk a little bit about some work that we're doing, but also engage with you in um, how you're thinking about where you wanna be going because I think in some ways you're sort of going through uncharted territory and it would be great to be collaborating a little bit more on some of these things. So um, I, a couple quick um, uh, attributions. Um, Rob Abel is CEO of IMS Global. Rob and I work very closely. I'm, I'm the chair of the board right now for IMS Global and I've been that way since 2015. Um, and so a lot of the vision of IMS is really Rob um, and I'm here helping to just sort of share that. Um, Vince Kellen, who is the CIO at the University of California, San Diego. Vince is also on the board of IMS Global. Vince and I have really been uh, spending a lot of time talking about next generation analytics environments. And so one of the things I'm gonna talk about during my talk is sort of where we're looking at going and creating a next generation analytics environment um, to be able to take advantage of all the data that learning analytics can actually provide. And finally, I wanna thank Malcolm Brown, who is um, the director for the Educause Learning Initiative. Malcolm has been one of the people who has really been um, preeminent in thinking about learning and the whole next generation digital learning environment comes out of work that Malcolm has done as part of a Gates grant um, that was there. And so I'll be glad to sort of fill in how this is all connected to that as we talk later. Um, a couple things about UMBC that, you know, it's hard to pronounce the name. We, we turn out we're the only research university that somehow has the word county in our name. So UMBC is um, 15,000 students. We are 52 years old, founded in 66. We are just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. If you've ever flown into BWI Airport, we are about four miles from BWI Airport. Um, we are about 55% of our incoming freshmen are STEM. Uh, we predominantly focus on um, engineering, IT, um, and the sciences, but we have a number of other uh, majors which are very digital. Um, our media and communication study is very digital. Our in, we have an animation and art program which is very digital. So it's, it's a very IT-centric. Um, what's interesting about UMBC is, is we started a program uh, back in the late 80s. Um, we now lead the country in sending African Americans on to get PhDs in STEM. Um, and that's been a big thing for us because um, when you look um, for a small school the size of UMBC, many of those students have actually come to Georgia Tech, gotten their PhDs here um, that are there. But we see that as one of the ways that we are thinking about how we innovate in learning. So the idea of starting this program back in the late 80s, that required us to sort of rethink the way we do education. Um, how we bring people in, how we have them work together in teams. Um, and so we've had this sort of focus for the last 25 years in thinking about um, how we move forward as an institution in the teaching and learning space. Um, for the last 10 or 12 years, if you ever look at US News and World Report, UMBC tends to show up in the top 10 for best undergraduate teaching and top 10 for most innovative universities. Um, we're a place because we're young, we're trying to do things a little bit differently. And so that's been good for me because technology is always a part and parcel of doing things a little bit differently. Um, our president is Freeman Rabowski. He's pretty, you know, we're unique in that he has been president of UMBC since 1992. Um, I, I, he has been my boss. I, I've reported to him since 2002. So you can see we have a stability of leadership um, that has happened at UMBC um, over the last 25, 27 years um, in order to be able to move forward. Um, and it's just, it's always listed as one of the uh, top places to work and um, in US News and World Report or the Chronicle of Higher Education, almost every category we show up as um, a great place to work. So about myself, so 
I'm one of those that comes to a university and never leaves. So I went to UMBC in 1976. First in my family to go to a university. Um, ended up, I was going to transfer to College Park and be an engineer. Um, couldn't leave UMBC because we couldn't afford to send me to College Park. I would have had to live on campus. And so I ended up doing math, applied math. And while I was doing the applied math degree at UMBC, it turned out computer science was in the mathematics department at that time and ended up getting an applied math and computer science track um, degree. Got hired as a student, graduated in 1980, and um, they offered me a job. Well, many of you don't realize 1980 had some of the worst unemployment <laughs> around. Took the job, thought I'd spend two or three years later there. 38 years later, I'm still at UMBC. Um, luckily, I, I have moved a little bit throughout there. Um, but it's one of those places where we do see people spending their life. Um, I've been the VP of IT and CIO since uh, 1997 at UMBC. Um, prior to that, I, I worked there in various roles. Most of my roles were pretty technical. I came up through the systems programming group, network engineering, um, Unix systems administration. Um, my first opportunity to teach was assembly language programming. Um, then in the 90s, I did a lot of work teaching a, a Unix systems administration uh, class in, in our IS department. Um, I've had the opportunity to be on a number of boards from um, Internet2 to Educause to IMS, um, did a lot of time in the cybersecurity space, identity management, and the last five or six years um, I've really sort of merged into the teaching and learning space. So that's sort of, I've got a broad background on a lot of different things. Um, so what I'm going to discuss, uh, I'm going to spend a couple minutes just sort of talking about historical basis for technology going to go into what this next generation digital learning environment is and isn't. You know, we talk about it, but what is it supposed to be? Talk about how it's coming together and where IMS fits into that. And then I'm going to sort of be talking using UMBC as an example and talking about how we're envisioning the next generation digital learning environment from a UMBC perspective. And then at the end, I'm going to sort of step back and from attending the sale conference, I, I want to sort of talk a little bit with you, and this will probably feed into the question and answer part about how I see some of this relating to Georgia Tech and what you're trying to do with sale um, here. And you know, if, if you have questions while I'm talking, feel free to interrupt. It's pretty informal, so I, I'm glad to, to sort of deal with it in whatever way works best. Yes. That, that sounds great. I, you're probably more expert than I. <laughs> SAIL stands for Scalable Advanced Learning Ecosystems. Oh. And we had a summit about this uh, back at the end of November, uh, of which uh, Jack was a part, uh, as well as, as many of us around campus. We had people from all over the country who came to talk about what their vision would be for how we create uh, a learning ecosystem uh, that encompasses student services and business services and technology uh, and, and instructional change, and so on and so forth. So that's how it relates here. Thank you. Yes, no, I, I, I think your vision of holistically wrapping around um, how you're going to support the student is really, um, uh, really the key in through this. So I, I'm going to go way back, you know, and, and so I didn't grow up with computers. But again, you know, I, I started college in 1976. You didn't have personal computers. You know, unless you built your own computer or you got you know, a little TRS-80, um, you weren't going to be using computers uh, before then. My first uh, use of a computer is the Apple IIe. Um, they ended up using, we had these um, in our microcomputer lab at that point. Um, what's interesting to me is you know, starting in, in 1977, um, you can begin to see that you know, technology and how it's going to be used in instruction was constantly changing. My first job was really in what was called academic computing. My job was to work with faculty in how to use computing for research or how to use computing for their courses. And so more often than not, faculty in the, in the late 70s, early 80s were interested in using it in their um, research. 
but they were starting to bleed into, oh, I want to present this or I want to talk about this in my class. Um, but we really didn't begin to see things taking off until NSFNet. And so, you know, again, UMBC was connected to College Park in the early 80s as part of starting to do the ARPANET and other sorts of things. Um, NSFNet got set up at UMBC probably in 1985 is when we started working on the internet. Um, one of the areas that I spent a lot of time on back in that period was uh, I was responsible for helping to sort of think through what our strategy was going to be for doing internet information. Now, does anybody in here remember Gopher? Yeah, a couple of people. Okay, so Gopher and Waze were some of the early protocols that started to come out. I was lucky in that I had a Next machine that I had bought for myself um, in the late 80s, and it turned out the first sort of web browsers were available on the Next machine. And so we started playing with this in 89 and 90, and sort of that has sort of changed my direction in thinking about how UMBC was going to go. And so I got very um, interested in the web in that early day um, and starting to launch that. The first experience that I had, this person standing, is Murray Goldberg. Does anyone know who Murray Goldberg is? So, so he was a computer science faculty member at University of British Columbia, and he created WebCT. And this came out in uh, 1996, and it was sort of the first way of setting up a course. You know, if you wanted to do a very simple LMS, it was written all in Perl. I mean, for any of you who are computer science students, it was, you know, kind of interesting to see how, you know, that was, was run. Um, but we loaded WebCT. We started running various classes, getting faculty to be using this in the mid-90s. Um, and, you know, you sort of saw the challenges of trying to teach, you know, with the Internet in the mid-90s as you were going through that. You know, 2006, you know, how many of you stood in line with me to get the first Apple One, you know, phone that came out, you know, there? And then we continue to sort of go on. So from 2006, the, you can't see it down at the bottom, but that's a screen that shows data that sort of talks about the fact that in the late 2000s, 2007 and 8, we began setting up our data warehouse at UMBC and started to provide a lot more learning analytics. We were mining our Blackboard system to pull data out of Blackboard. Um, and then you move forward to MOOCs and, and now the NGDLE um, that's sort of there. And so as we're moving through this, I think what we're really thinking about is how we can make things richer. And so the key takeaways I sort of noted is, is, well, you know, we don't worry about devices. You just assume everything is internet connected and is going to be um, web accessible or going to be mobile accessible um, for this. We've really seen the importance of content. Content's always been the key differentiator um, in, the, in the internet age. And I think that's part of what you're seeing in your program, that Georgia Tech is doing this program. It's a different type of content, people believe, than what might be if it's Western governors or someone else. And so to me, you're helping to sort of blaze a trail where you're having research faculty thinking about this content and what that means um, from an educational standpoint. I really believe data analytics is going to be one of the key things that we have to be thinking about over the next few years. I'm going to talk about this more as we go through this. And then this idea of personalization and user-centered design. Um, I, I would say we're still in the era where a lot of these things um, are kludgy. They're not, when you go from the LMS to certain other kinds of tools, you don't get the same preferences, you don't get the same user experience. This is an area where we really need to be thinking as we go forward how we build standards so that my set of preferences will move with me to whatever I want to be going with. Um, and I think that's an area where there's ripe for really moving forward um, in standards over the next few years. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, towards the end. Um, so how did I get involved in this? So turns out um, I was chairing the In Common Federation. 
in common is our U.S. Higher Ed Federation for single sign-on. Georgia Tech is a member. 700, it's about 700 schools now are part of the federation. Um, it's, it's been very successful. We began talking with Rob about what IMS was doing. We were trying to think how we could integrate federation with LTI at that point in time. And um, we started having discussions, and I really um, began to find Rob to be um, very visionary in what he was thinking about. And so I knew Malcolm very well, and, and we started having conversations about where learning was going and what were the challenges. Um, and and you've got to recognize, this is 2012, where we're having these conversations. And what we were saying was is that um, learning really was siloed. You know, if you think back six, seven years, the LMS vendors wanted you to buy an LMS product and then you were going to live with the tools and the vendor relationships that that LMS vendor had established. It was what we began to call a walled garden, that you would always live in one ecosystem and if you didn't like that you, and you wanted to use a tool that was in a different ecosystem, you were out of luck and that really wasn't going to be what was best for education. And so we wrote this article on um, a new architecture for learning, and we sort of started with the idea that right now, in 2012 or 2013, learning environments were too brittle, and, and they're, may, they're still too brittle today. Um, often, if a faculty member wants to install or bring new content into a course, you might be asking that faculty member to bring you that content months before the class starts because, oh, we've got to integrate it, we've got to test it, we've got to validate it's going to work, we can't just let you decide a week before you're going to use it in a class that we can integrate it easily into our content. Um, and so what we were saying is, is that you need to have a way that you can easily integrate um, applications in a day rather than months. It shouldn't be this hard. We need to be able to say that faculty can take control of being able to do this, that you shouldn't need a system admin who runs an LMS to have to work with a vendor on the other end to be configuring and setting up a product on your behalf. And that the analytics that came from that third party product had to be able to flow back into an environment so that you could create a 360 degree view. Now, those three statements, they seem like, you know, common sense today. They were, um, you know, were heretical, <laughs> um, you know, back in 2012 because we just weren't doing it. We hadn't thought about what this would mean or how to even set up to do this. And this is where the connection with IMS comes in. Because to do these things, it takes standards. It takes a common approach that vendors, suppliers, um, LMS vendors can all agree on if you're going to begin doing these kinds of things at scale. Um, and so that was where IMS really was of interest to me, is thinking about that particular way of leveraging the fact that um, we could be doing using standards to scale this. And so that old architecture, everything that you did was completely separate. You know, if, if you had a classroom capture system, it was completely separate from your LMS system. It might have integrated in, it might not have integrated in. Um, if you were using electronic text, um, it was doubtful that they integrated into your learning environment, um, certainly not seamlessly. Um, and clicker and assessment systems, everything was completely a standalone system with no way of sharing data across that. And what the article goes on to sort of talk about is this environment where you're connecting learning environments and tools and content back with enterprise systems and other systems. And again, in a way, this is where you're going now with your sale vision of thinking about business services, student services, um, how this all wraps in to be supporting students to be making sure that um, they're as successful as you can be. And we, we laid out this sort of vision for how this could be coming together. 
And through the middle, we really saw that what had to be the focus is on developing standards that were going to enable these um, activities to happen. And we'll go in a little bit later and we'll talk about some of the standards that have come out and how they're evolving to make this happen. But this idea of being able to have a 360 degree view of a student, but to be able to think about this from everywhere is I think the unique piece that we tried to lay out at that time. So fast forward, um, we, a year and a half later, um, Ra, uh, Malcolm with um, other people from Educause, they get a Gates grant and they come out with the next generation digital learning environment. Um, what's interesting is, is that um, as you see the report that, that came out on this, I think it was, yeah, April of 2015. So it's about 18 months later. And I, did anybody participate? Did you all participate in any of the focus groups, Pam, that they held for, for the next gen digital learning environment? Because yeah, I, I know Educause ran a series of focus groups because I participated in a couple of them um, that were there and I, I just didn't know. But they ended up bringing members of the community together for um, various what if scenarios. What, what doesn't work today? What would you like to be seeing happen? What do you need to be able to support faculty in the classroom um, and to be able to innovate? And so that ended up being sort of the basis for where this next generation digital learning. Now, now, the definitions that um, Malcolm came up with, I think, are kind of abstract, but they, again, they sort of fit to where you're going thinking about sale. Um, it's really about, they use a confederation of IT systems. You could call that an ecosystem. Um, and it's going to include content, it's going to include analytics, and it's going to have applications and digital services that are all going to come together to work seamlessly on behalf of the user. That was the, the first definition. Um, they also wanted to highlight that this next generation digital learning environment isn't the LMS 2.0. You know, the, the LMS is incredibly important, but the LMS shouldn't be trying to do everything that we want to do in a learning environment. There are functions that the LMS should be sort of tailoring down on and really making sure it can do the teaching and learning aspects very well. Some of the other aspects where they were starting to go into, we believed that they probably should be looked at um, in other areas with other tools at that time. And maybe the LMS isn't there to be trying to do everything, um, which was the direction that many of the vendors were trying to go at that time. So, the NGDLE ends up having these five areas that they highlight. Interoperability and integration. You've got to be able to easily and seamlessly bring tools together to be able to share them and integrate them um, very easily. Personalization. You know, we need to be developing ways, that, and personalization takes two dimensions. It takes the um, user experience dimension but it also takes the fact that learning is a personal journey. And as you think about adaptive learning, we need to be thinking about creating learning content that allows students to be taking advantage of the fact that we've got a wealth of content. And as they hit a concept that maybe they should have mastered, but they didn't, they can easily go back and get more information and maybe build themselves back up to now understand that concept deeper. And so adaptive learning systems really were going to be a key element. And then we, we talk about analytics, advising, and learning assessment. These three elements sort of come together to be thinking about pedagogy, what's working, how you should be moving forward to advance that. Um, collaboration was highlighted in the fact that increasingly students have tools that they're used to using. And we shouldn't be foreclosing their ability to bring what they already know and like into the learning environment. And so we should be thinking about being open-ended. 
And then lastly, but certainly not least, accessibility has got to be right from the beginning in thinking about this. Um, we need to be having a broader vision for how accessibility is going to work and what that means in a learning environment if we're going to um, move forward. And when we begin to think about accessibility, you know, some of the examples that I've seen that, that would be fabulous. So let's say um, my native language is um, Spanish or Mandarin. I may want to be able to get video content delivered to me in that language versus English. Now, we think, well, that's very hard to have all of these different things. Well, I would sort of go back to Georgia Tech and say, I'm going to bet you in the next five years, you know, we'll have automatic language translation being relatively um, good. We already know Microsoft can do it on spoken word where they, they do the un underneath of it in different languages. Um, we'll have this capability of being able to provide you know, audio into what you want to hear um, in the language of your choice. That is the kind of thing that I ought to be able to set a preference for. And now I can consume content if it's been set up automatically to give me in the language of my preference. And so these are the way we were trying to think moving forward. <clears throat> so give me a second. <clears throat> so I think you get a sense of why I think it's important. <clears throat> so for. For me, what has really been <clears throat> the interesting question, and <clears throat> sorry, um, our president has a vision that um, we can do better in this country in STEM. And that vision comes from the fact that um, there are very few places where STEM actually is done well. And, and his, his argument for this is, if you look at data, um, there is no, he studied STEM through um, work that he did under um, Obama's, um, there was a Department of Ed group that was looking at STEM education in the US. And what they saw is that when you look at students who start in STEM and finish in STEM, there was no group of students um, that ended up achieving even a 50% success rate in STEM. Um, you would say that um, Asian students were probably the highest. They were about 48%. Um, white students were in the upper 30s. Um, African-American, Hispanic, upper 20s, low 20s in those ranges. We were doing an awful job. Even at universities that graduate 95% of their students, they don't, they, they fail them in STEM. And, and the, the classic example that we see is, um, I'll pick Caltech or MIT. Um, most of the students who go to those have almost perfect math SATs, yet they grade on a curve in their um, entry-level math classes. These students have never gotten in less than an A. You know, and so the first time you're in an entry-level STEM class and you get a C or a B, you're changing majors, you know? And, and when, you, when he would talk to those universities, because we were sending our students who got bachelors to Caltech, to MIT, they're thriving in their labs and they're asking, how are we doing this? And the conversation that was happening was is that when these students would go to those schools, they were getting a B in that early class and that was sort of, okay, you shouldn't stay, you should go into um, financial economics. You know, we, we see so many students wanting to go into financial economics to work in Wall Street or be a quant that we weren't seeing the idea of how you keep them in STEM. And so one of the things that we really want to think about at UMBC is how we can do STEM better. What's that going to mean at the calculus level? You know, when, when we look at our STEM for calculus, our upper quartile looks a lot like your students in the upper quartile, but our mid-levels are a lot lower 
because you don't go down as far as we do in terms of your SAT bands. And so the question that we've been asking is, can the suburban student that got 600, 625 on their um, math SAT and was a solid B student in their suburban school district, can't they be successful in STEM? At a lot of places, they can't. And we think we should be able to redesign our teaching environments to get them to be able to be successful if we, they are motivated to be successful. Now, a lot of it comes down to motivation and how hard you're willing to work. But one of the things that we're trying to do is we want to understand um, where students are falling out. And so that gets to number two. We have to have a robust data environment. We, you know, we need to understand what students are doing in the classroom more than we do now. Um, doing a pedagogical innovation and then finding that um, students really aren't consuming that innovation. I'll pick flipped classroom. Um, we think flipped classroom should be a better way of teaching. Bring students in, they prepare the night before, they're in small groups, they're working on problems, there's a lot of back and forth. That should work better. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. We don't really understand why it does for some students, why it doesn't for others. Data can help us begin to understand these things. And so we need to be thinking about how we create data environments. Um, learning is personal. You know, what we see happen in a lot of instances when, in failure in STEM is that students had a bad teacher in Algebra 2. If a student didn't really master Algebra 2, when they get into calculus, when they get into some of their physics classes, that's where it begins to be a weakness that would be there. We need to go back and try to see, can we help them master what they didn't learn? Um, and there's some software that we're you know, looking at, like Alex and others, to sort of see, can this be a possibility? And then lastly, we want to incent faculty to innovate in the classroom. And so by giving them more data, we think we're giving them the opportunity to say, go at it. This is your opportunity to, to think out of the box and try to do things a little bit differently. And so that's why the NGDLE is important to me. It's, it's something that allows us to bring these elements together to support innovation in the classroom. So a quick example. And we have a lot of things that are out in, at UMBC off of an analytics website called doit.umbc.edu slash analytics. Um, but one of the things that we were doing, and this sounds stupid when you think of it in face, on face value, but what we wanted to do is we have um, Vital Source as our electronic textbook provider. We have Blackboard as our LMS provider. We wanted to integrate analytics from the e-textbook with Blackboard's LMS, how much they're using the LMS, how they're doing on quizzes, with also student grades coming from our SIS. We just wanted to know. You know, what we were really trying to understand at the end of the day is a simple question. Does reading the textbook matter? Now, if you're a faculty member, most of you will raise your hand and say yes. But you know, what a lot of students we find is, is that a lot of students don't get into the textbook. And so one of the things that we ended up seeing as we ended up doing this data integration and we went forward, so we did a set of classes. These classes um, included our um, calculus for non-STEM majors, Math 155, Physics 122 is our standard electricity and magnetism class, um, STAT 355 is statistics for biology, chemistry uh, majors that would be there. Um, it also is a preliminary for entering the math statistics area. And then we had uh, foreign language classes, our Spanish 201 um, and a psych class um, as well that were in this. And what we looked at is, is what were the regular pass rates and things like that, that that came out. What we ended up sort of seeing as we went through this is um, that, not surprisingly, and again, this is just stating the obvious, but it's nice ultimately to have data to prove the obvious, which was students who came into the class with uh, basically a C grade point average. If they didn't open the textbook, in the first four weeks of class, they had about a 37% chance of passing 
the class. I'll go over to this one. Oh, uh, sorry, one more slide. Uh, yeah, basically this band of students, if they didn't open the textbook in the first four weeks of class, we sort of knew at the four week mark, they're gone, you know, in through this. What's gonna happen is, is they get hit in that first exam, which usually comes between the fourth and fifth week mark. They hadn't been prepared for what they're gonna be getting on the first exam. And usually they do poorly and they don't end up staying in the class. If they had been using the textbook, they had a 90%. Now, one of the things that we're starting to do is, is all right, we're starting to capture little data systems like this. We, another area where we've done a lot of research was um, looking at students who are taking math a second time. What we find, um, if a student is taking math, a sec the same class a second time, we only give you two times to take a class. If you don't pass it on the second time, you have to go through an appeal process, which you may or may not um, be granted. Um, what we found is, is that if students started working with our learning resource center from day one, the second time they were teaching class, they had a very high probability of passing. If they waited until after the first exam or they didn't participate with the Learning Resource Center, they had a very low probability of passing. And so it was one of those examples where when we first looked at Learning Resource Center data, we couldn't see any difference that it was making on students because frankly, the, the students that use our Learning Resource Center are mostly our pre-med, um, pre-professional students who are trying to go from a B to an A. You know, it's all about getting straight A's. It's not about passing the course. We don't have to worry about them. What we weren't getting is the students who really need it to be using it. And so we started a nudging campaign. Once we collect data, we start nudging them through um, alerts and other things. Hey, did you know that if you do this, by the way, if you um, don't pass it this time, you have to go through an appeal process. Just letting students know where we're creating an environment to try to be supporting them was helpful in this. Um, and it was one of those sort of insights that we wouldn't have gotten if we couldn't have looked at the vital source data. Because in the past, we just didn't know who was looking at the textbook and who wasn't. Everyone assumed if you assigned the reading material, it was being read. So that one. Um, so the, the other one that I'll just say before I get into this one, um, we're doing a, another project this year in, in this semester with about 12 courses where we're taking, um, we're working with ACT. And this one is an interesting one because ACT has a survey that will um, look at students and what it w has been validated on in the K through 12 space. We haven't validated it yet in the um, higher ed space. But what it tries to look at is grit and perseverance. Sort of this internal, I'm gonna push my way through problems issue. And what we're trying to see is based upon how students score in that, how do they use the electronic textbooks and the LMS? How do they deal with issues when they don't do well on a problem or they don't do well in a quiz in the LMS? Does that double their intensity or do they drop off? What we're trying to understand is, is can the, the first test from ACT tell us something about how students are using the LMS and do those behaviors in the LMS and electronic textbook align with what we would expect for those um, attributes that came out of the ACT. So it's sort of a cross validation. But again, this kind of activity you could never have done unless you're beginning to instrument the data environments that are there um, and begin to let, um, you know, try this out in different ways. Sure. So with the um, survey, well, with the data that you guys collected on campus, with the students not using the textbook, did you just survey them and ask them? And is that where you got that data from? You know, yes, I'm using the textbook, no, I'm not. No. So, so in, with the electronic textbooks, every time you open a page, every time you highlight something, we're seeing what you're doing in that electronic textbook. And so it's real data that's coming in. And what we, we noticed is, is, you know, just actually starting to get in and read the textbook was really the key thing mm -hmm. into that one. And then with ACT, their um, data on grit, 
Mm -hmm. Do you know if they were testing for academic grit or grit in general regarding other life issues? So I, because I'm guessing that it's a bit of both. Okay. Be, because this is used in the K through 12 um, quite a bit as part of um, a survey that ACT has been doing for about five or six years. It's not been used in higher ed. Okay. And so what we were going to be doing is, is we're just sort of testing out. Arizona State is another one that's trying this out with them, and, and um, they're going to also be presenting some results back from this. Okay. So um, how should universities be preparing. I think I'm, I think I'm reasonable timing in this. Okay, so I've just sort of, okay. Um, so I think IMS really has a key role in, in helping you think about the next generation digital learning environment. So, so the IMS really focuses its technical standards on connecting to either software, digital resources, or tools. So we have a whole set of standards that I'll talk a little bit about that work with that. Um, LTI is the one that most people know because that's almost ubiquitous now in the tool space. Um, we've just come out with a new update to the LTI standard called LTI Advantage, which we think is going to be a game changer um, because it allows you to do everything without having to do API calls. Um, you can now seamlessly integrate things in, you can transfer grades, you can have identity. LTI Advantage is something that just was released um, literally in the last two months as the final standard. The good news about this is all three of the major LMS vendors we're at the table working with us on the implementation. So we know all of the LMS vendors are committed to supporting this, and the tool vendors will be able to now take advantage of it. Um, the second part that's there is how to enable scalable data-informed instruction and learning um, that's student-centered and personalized. And that's a lot harder. Because now you're getting less into just technical activities, but also into how you support teaching and other ways of doing things. But what we're thinking about is we can be helpful in helping universities instrument their environments to be able to bring data to bear. And we can also be helpful in thinking about how standards like LTI Advantage can be extended to support this personalization profile that could flow with users so that they can get content um, as they want to. And so I, I know we, most of you probably can't read this given I didn't realize the projector thing that was here. But this going around the side are the five dimensions of um, the NGDLE, interoperability, personalization, analytics, accessibility, um, collaboration and accessibility and universal design. And then all of these items are functions that sort of align partially to different areas within the NGDLE. And so what we're really thinking about is how we can support everything that's inside that circle um, better over time. And what that means is, is that um, we have sort of built out a set of key initiatives to try to be doing that. And so the, the first one that's up at the very top is thinking about digital curriculum. So the EPUB standard, you know, it's being commonly used IMS standard. Um, EPUB 3 is, came out a few years ago. Um, how you do question and answers. The QTI standard, which allows question databases to move from one LMS to another LMS, is an IMS standard that's there. Um, that falls into the e-assessment element. When you started having lots of testing taking place, we came to the table to help with how do you build out standards to allow these things to move not just from um, LMS to LMS, but also internationally across languages and things like that. Um, digital credentialing. IMS owns the, um, is leading the open badges standard. So we have the open badges V2 standard, which just came out um, in the last year. Um, micro credentialing is one of the elements 
you know, Pam and I were talking a little bit about how it can provide insight into the skills and outcomes that you're expecting to come from courses and be able to track that across the student activities. Where UMBC is using digital credentialing is universities are about an academic experience, but they're also about a co-curricular experience. Being at a university, you're part of a community, you have internships, you have clubs, you do leadership activities. We've never really tracked those items, and, and this digital credentialing allows us to look across the, holistically at the student experience that would be there. Learning data and analytics, I'll talk a little bit more on that. Learning platforms, apps, and tools. That's LTI, LMSs, all this integration capability that's sitting there. Um, all of these are the standards that, L that IMS is moving forward. And, and my reason for wanting to reach out and come down here is we need use cases that push the boundaries. If you're going to see standards evolve over time, you need good use cases which you might not have thought about. I think sale is one of those places that you're going to develop some good use cases that not necessarily everyone is thinking about. Arizona State's another school that's pushing the use cases and they've been actively engaged. When you try to teach 100,000 students online, that also generates a set of use cases that would be there. Southern New Hampshire University is generating some interesting use cases as we start to look at it. We need people who want to push the boundaries to be coming to IMS so we can be building out the standards standards so that all suppliers can be supporting them effectively. Um, I'm not going to go too much in detail. I think I've talked a lot about this. Um, I'm going to spend a little time sort of talking about how we're planning at UMBC to be doing the next gen digital learning environment. So the first thing which I think you sort of gather is we're instrumenting our learning environment. And I'll show you a little bit how we're doing that in a second. Um, the second piece is really building out a very robust learning record store in Amazon. And I'll show you an example of what we're doing. It's really been amazing um, what we've been able to achieve at the cost points that are there. Um, we've been spending time working with student affairs and some of our academic programs and thinking about how we want to launch micro-credentials on campus. And, and that's really starting to come to fruition right now where we're starting to deploy them um, a lot faster. Um, we're look, working with our student affairs office on a standard that's called the comprehensive learner record. And you can think of the comprehensive learner record as something that integrates your academic transcript with all your micro-credentials. Now, where you're all trying to go, throw blockchain on top of that so that they can take the comprehensive learning record and share selectively with selected parties, that's how you're going to scale these kinds of things is thinking about how we, we build technologies on top of standards to be able to now do new things. Um, we have a, um, a large NIH grant for um, sort of developing STEM programs, especially for transfer students to move them into graduate school. And so we're building out, um, because we get transfers from all different community colleges, we find that they're at different places. And so we're building out some um, adaptive release software that we can be presenting to the students so that wherever they come to us from, they have the capability of getting to the same level of mastery through this. Um, and then um, we're working with Blackboard to launch their Ally product um, to improve their, our accessibility of materials. And then lastly, um, we're starting a pilot project with faculty where we can start to say, um, we have what's called a Rabowski Innovation Award Fund um, that allows faculty to get some money for doing innovative activities in the classroom. And we're launching a series that will be around instrumenting um, activities and allowing to give them learning analytics and custom reports and things like that on what's happening from a data intensive standpoint. So um, I'll talk a little bit about our learning record store. So we launched it in the uh, early fall last year out in AWS. Um, for the fall, we ended up doing about 140 million events um, that came through. Um, most of that was in the Blackboard Caliper events um, that were there. We, Rex is our data warehouse. 
we're importing now our data warehouse um, into the learning record store so that we can add context to the learning data that we get. Um, my UMBC is our student portal. Um, everything goes through our student portal, and so we're interested in seeing how students use our student portal um, because that's how you sign up for events and other sorts of things. So we're loading that data in. Um, and what's interesting, and I'll show you the AWS model, um, all of this is costing me about $150 a month out in AWS um, to be doing this. And, and I have a great enterprise architect, and what he did is, is he basically leveraged the fact that AWS can do all of these things with the building blocks that AWS provides. And so what we do over here is, you know, Amazon CloudFront just sits there as a caching engine. Blackboard, Vital Source, other tool providers are going to stream us a bunch of events periodically. We wanted to make sure that if we were somehow down, we didn't lose the stream that they sent to us and have to go back and say, hey, could you resend this? Because they're not designed to do that. So sticking Amazon CloudFront in front of it allows us to cache all of these things automatically. Um, the stream <coughs> is really going to an API front end, which is just an HTTP post. And so the API is just really pulling it out of CloudFront is what's happening at that point. AWS Lambda is just a way of having some basic um, service. Have any, has anybody okay. used AWS Lambda? A couple of you. Yeah. You know, we have some simple Python code. What we get is we get a batch of thousands of events at, at a time. What we want to do is unpack them. So we just run a small Python script on AWS Lambda, which takes the, you know, the thousands of events and breaks them up into discrete events. Um, we send those discrete events over to um, Amazon Kinesis Firehose, and we load them out into S3. We do that because we may want to go back and look at the raw data at some particular point, and it's cheap to store things out in S3. Um, having it there, if we ever decide we want to adjust the way we do things, we can just reprocess our data. Um, AWS Glue is just a tool set that AWS provides that literally is providing Hadoop and some other tools to process the data. And so what we do with the glue is we go through and we look at what the structure of that data is. And from AWS glue, it loads it out into Redshift, which is just a basic Postgres database that's out there. Glue, though, is determining, did we get a different structure coming in? If so, it'll add that field into the tables that it's loading out into Redshift. We don't even have to be worrying about having a predefined data model for what we're going to be sticking out in Redshift. It'll adjust as vendors change. It was interesting. Blackboard went from sending us Caliper 1.0 to 1.1 events, and nothing broke. Even though the structure changed somewhat, the glue just said, oh, OK, these new fields have been added. We'll add them into the table structure. Boom. That's automatically happening. Um, now what we're going to be doing is, is we're putting a, a, a visual front end onto what we want to be using Redshift for. So we'll probably add um, tools like Tableau, but we may also just stick Jupyter Notebooks or R or other things out there to be processing the data. Um, we don't know where we want to go or we don't know what faculty will want us to be providing them. We want to be able to have the flexibility, whatever AWS or some vendor is providing, we want to be able to stand up those tools on behalf of the faculty and let them um, dig in and see what's there. But what's interesting about this is one person was able to set this up. One person was able to maintain it. Um, it's not a full-time job. You know, we're now looking at this environment and we're saying this could be the environment where we load all of our traditional data warehouse analytics out into here as well. And now we might be able to give people more flexibility in looking at the tool set or how they want to process this. And so it's really causing us to step back and rethink the way that um, we're looking at how we want to do analytics on the campus going forward. Um, this is just a, a basic slide that sort of shows the vision. The, the idea of Caliper is it's just a way for things to get data 
post it, you know, streaming data. And so, you know, there could be all sorts of ways that you do this. You might decide that um, you've got a tool that's a software development environment and you want to be capturing how much the students are doing in that software development environment. All right, you could send it as caliper events and then you could be consuming it and if the instructor was interested in how are people using the software development environment that we've given them, we could be seeing then what that means. So that's really sort of the caliper side. Before I jump to the last two things, are there any questions on caliper or what we're doing with that? Are you seeing more vendors supporting caliper? Like we've seen a lot of vendors sort of paying lip service to it, but haven't really done too much yet. So two providers, is, are you seeing a change there? So I, I would say yes, and, and it's a challenge. So, so in all honesty, we are, um, I think we are the first customer to consume Blackboard's caliper data. And, and we will find inconsistencies and we let Blackboard know and they're fixing them, you know, in through this. And so um, and when we did Vital Source, what we found in Vital Source was um, Vital Source was sending us um, information. And as we started to look at it, we realized they track everything with their own internal ID. Well, that's not very useful for you having your own internal ID, how do I map it to the user that I want to compare to what they were doing in the LMS? Um, so we had to work with, oh, we have a flat file. So we end up having have a separate way where we pull a file from um, their analytics platform in that has the mapping between this. And so it's been a little bit of an interesting journey, but that's again, part of why I, you know, schools like Georgia Tech, you can push the envelope in through this, get vendors to help with this, debug these sorts of things. If we're gonna make these environments work, we've gotta be having people really dig in and use them um, and push the envelope, so to speak. But you're right, it, it has been a challenge on this. The other thing that, that I wanted to say is, well, well, Caliper is the IMS standard. One of the projects that we have going on in IMS is there's another standard called XAPI. And the reality is, is we don't care. You know, we want data to come in. To, we want to have as complete a data environment as we can. If data has to be loaded through XAPI, we'll do that. We're looking at ways we think there was a working group that believes that we could probably add functionality over time to Caliper to be able to support most of the common XAPI recipes and we would like to see that sort of happen. And that would be on our part to be making it so that it, you don't have to be changing what you're doing in XAPI. Um, the last two things I'll, I'll do, and then I'll get a little bit to sale, and that'll probably lead to the questions part, is um, micro-credentials. We're really just sort of launching the micro-credentials activities. Um, we're starting projects with, um, we've been using Credly and um, Portfolium as areas where we've been storing these in. Um, we also though sort of consume them and load them into our data warehouse so that we can be looking at how these credentials sort of impact what is going on within this. I think over time, this is gonna be one of the areas where for things like accreditation, where ABET wants to know you've gotten these sets of skills, we can be noting the skills through various classes and activities and produce something that would be like a comprehensive learning record to say, yes, all of our engineers meet the ABET standards because we can show you how we map these skills into the area that would be there. And so that's sort of the vision that we have for micro-credentials. I talked a little bit about the comprehensive learning record. I think that this is really one of those areas that um, we need campuses to be thinking, especially ones that are trying to push the co-curricular side of things a little bit differently. Oh, the one thing I think that would be interesting here for Georgia Tech in the sales space is just um, lifelong learning. To me, you know, allowing employers to be able to push Credentials will be a you know micro credentials, and then maybe Georgia Tech is is updating that and showing it was verified by the employer for training that they've done. This could be a really interesting thing for you connecting to your alums over time as you think about this lifelong learning space. That's one of the areas we're trying to think about it on. So how might this be for sale? So I'm going to switch real quickly to 
just something here, but I'll take questions while we're waiting. Um, so are there any questions that have come through on the chat or anything else before I just start jumping in to further things? No? The okay. chat Pardon? The chat wants to know if the slides will be available later. Yeah. OK. Um, personalization. There was a project that I, 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 it was funny. I went out and I could not find it on the, the IMS website. It had been on the IMS website, but it could have just been they've changed things around. But Georgia Tech had a first in the world grant maybe four years ago where it was looking at accessibility. And it was developing um, what was a profile for all of the kinds of things you needed to be thinking about for accessibility. One of the things that's really interesting to me is now with LTI Advantage, we have the opportunity to do bi-directional. The, um, the LMS can be sending information to the tool that would be, here's your profile. And to me, this is one of those areas where thinking about um, user interface and at least accommodation and accessibility is an area that's ripe. I, I'll throw out, you know, I don't, I, if you have an iPhone, do any of you use the accessibility feature in your iPhone? I might be the only one. So I, a lot of times I don't have my glasses. I like to be able to read my text messages. I make my font a little bit bigger. That's under the accessibility preferences. It's great when apps automatically use the features that are there, because now I don't have to worry about the fact that, oh, I've got to go in and make it bigger or this or that. We have that kind of capability before us if we can think through what does it mean for person, for, for accessibility. And I think some of the work that Georgia Tech did in that first in the world grant should be revisited at some point in time. So that's one area that is, um, is something. I know you talked in sale about advising, degree navigation. What's really the key is um, compre the comprehensive learning record is one of those things where it's not just about the classes you take and getting through those classes. That's important because getting a degree is critical. But if your career goals are to be doing A, B, or C, there's all these other things you need to be doing while you're in college to get to that point that you're going to be able to do that. So, so the, the example I like to use is, is um, we usually send a couple of students um, onto Google every summer. I'm sure you send a boatload you know, into this. One of the things we found is, is if students don't take data, don't take our algorithms class in their junior year, they don't do well on the interview process for Google because Google's interview is really about algorithms. And if you wait and take it in your senior year, you're not going to be doing as well in the interview process. So for students who want to do, um, you know, they're thinking that I want to try to do the Google interview, we're trying to be thinking, how can we recommend? You've got to be taking this in your, um, your spring or fall of your junior year because this is going to be important for you um, if you go for the interview process um, that they do. So it's little things like that that we think we can be helping people on as we move forward. Um, the lifelong learning, I, I think, again, I mentioned this as part of the comprehensive learning record. I love what you're doing with blockchain. Um, I have a link into this doc that um, talks about the fact that Southern New Hampshire University, the MIT startup learning machines are doing a blockchain effort um, and IMS has been participating in that. How blockchain works with the comprehensive learning record may or may not need to be a standard. But if you're all using the comprehensive learning record, it would allow multiple types of blockchain tools to be consuming the same thing because the comprehensive learning record is made up of discrete components that really look like open badge v2 components if you want to think of it that way and so the ims standards are really key to whatever you want to use in a blockchain world that would be there um, i talked a lot about app application integration earlier but this lti advantage is really one of the game changers that we think um, is going to be there. And if you're going to write any tools or do any development 
at Georgia Tech, making sure you're looking at the LTI 1.3 standard would be one that um, would really sort of set you apart and put you in a different spot. Um, identity standards, um, that's less here. Um, I think one of the areas that we were talking this morning that's ripe for research is how you look at um, adaptive learning questions. If you think about it, adaptive learning is really an expert system that's wrapped around question answers. And so what we don't have is good ways of extracting some of that question answer models from one tool to another tool. And so you almost have to start from scratch if you want to go from um, using Acrobat to some other tool that would be there. There's an opportunity for thinking about a standard at some point in time. We're not exactly sure what that is, but that might be a spot where Georgia Tech, if you're doing anything with adaptive learning, um, could be helping with sort of thinking about this because I think a lot of it is going to be how do you expose the underlying expert system um, into this as well. Um, speech processing um, is one where when we talked about in the, the SAIL conference, um, we know that the next generation user interface is going to be voice. Um, it, it's starting to happen in dribs and drabs now, but how we make this integrate into the learning environments, we haven't fully worked out yet. Um, is this going to be an LTI interface? It's doubtful. Now, maybe Georgia Tech would do this, where you'll stand up your own NLP cluster and be processing the voice and trying to, um, to do that. But most are going to consume services from Google, Microsoft, or Amazon. You know, that's what we're seeing happen in the world, is that vendors are going to be providing voice to text, if you want to think of it. And how do we then interface that into our learning environments um, for people to be able to use is one that I think is, is really um, interesting. The, um, we talked a little bit about intelligent tutoring, the adaptive mechanism. Um, intelligent search is another one. So, so we're just getting ready in IMS to be launching a um, new LTI resource for searching across LTI accessible resources. This is going to open up the idea of being able to search across lots of different um, content repositories that you may own. You know, it's not the traditional Google search, but how do you look across those um, different things that you own for the best content? I think there's how we make it relevant, what the relevance algorithm is going to be, is going to be a great computer science sort of question um, into that. Just making it that you can do it was part of IMS. But how you do it well is where we need people to really be stepping back and thinking about this. And was there anything? Sorry. Uh, the, um, the last one I would just say that we're really also focused on is thinking about how we do privacy management and security. And that's one where we're really trying to think about um, how we can come up with the ways so that n right now every school goes and does a security and privacy review on every app. And that seems like it's a lot of redundant work. And there ought to be able to be some way of having some commonality where we can share um, a best practice approach. And so if Georgia Tech did something, I may be willing to accept what Georgia Tech had done related to that um, into this. Or if UMBC did something, you might accept that because we're sharing the same approach in the way that we do app vetting. Or we've got a process down that it's an independent group that's looking at it on behalf of all of higher ed that could be there. And we see that as something that um, IMS is starting to stand up and we think could be a, a way that we do this. And so that's the end. I don't know. 12.48, so about an hour. <laughs> so any questions or comments? I'm curious about the comprehensive learner record and the idea you said about uh, employers pushing uh, their commitments uh, to that record. Have you thought about how, what you accept, what you would accept as something? Are you just saying, hey, this employer said it, you can take it or leave it? So, it, it, no, it's a, it's a great question. And, and I think that's the challenge of what these records are going to ultimately look at. But if we think about it as a student is going 
to enable this. So, so you, I, I don't know, as part of lifelong learning, will you be allowing students to maintain an account lifelong or some mechanism here? OK, I that would expect you as well. So if a student owns this account and it wants to put that information in their comprehensive learning record, who are we to say that's not worthy? If the student is deciding that this is important to me and the employer is prepared to create a badge that has a validation mechanism, OK, this employer validated it for this, we ought to allow that, I think. Um, now, is it going to clutter? This, yes, and that may be where the blockchain says you don't want to be sharing this because um, you're going to see a lot of things that are cluttered that aren't pertinent to what you want to share your comprehensive learning record to this other party with. And so you'd be able to filter it to filter out the things that are less pertinent and be able to show the items that are, but there's still a validation mechanism there. But that's the way we're trying to think about it is, is in that way. But I think your point is, is really well taken. What we don't know now is, is everybody going to have a badge for everything and it's just going to be pure babble, you know, that, you know, we can't tell what any of this means and how to make it worthwhile. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, the question that I think will sort itself out over the next five years. You see a lot of companies, a lot of groups trying to sort of lay out frameworks for thinking about the credentialing space. Yeah, that, that's one of the trickier things that we're sort of working on is the um, market valuation of the blockchain credentialing. Mm -hmm. so Yeah. Other questions, or? I had a question that came in online, and um, I also want to mention that we have 14 people online. Oh. Most of we've ever had. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll get a badge for that, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the question is, uh, has, has there been any work done on accessibility of websites for the visually impaired, the hearing impaired, uh, mentally challenged, uh, and, and so on? You know, uh, I think no, not fully, to all of those components that would be there. Ally was, is the first tool that we found that is very helpful for sort of looking at how you have designed your course, at least for visually impaired. And there are a lot of things that would meet accessibility, but if you were trying to um, navigate the course in a screen reader, you were going eight or 10 levels deep. And if you ever try to use a screen reader and you see what that experience is like, it's horrible. And so Ally sort of highlights where you've gone into um, bad practice. And, and so we think that that's a, a, a first starting point. On some of the other dimensions, um, I, don't th I think there needs to be some basic research that's probably done as to how you will sort of handle um, you know, the levels of consumption that may be there um, in thinking about that um, and how you're presenting that information in different ways. But, but to your answer the question, I, I think that's an area that's still ripe for a lot of uh, further research. Any others? How involved are companies like Credly and Badger and even Learning Machine with the, the, the comprehensive learning, learner record project? Are they looking at that at all? Or? So, so the question, just I guess I'll repeat it just in case it wasn't heard. So the question was, how involved are companies like Credly, um, Learning Machines, other suppliers with the comprehensive learning record? They're certainly part, they, they are incredibly active in the Open Badges V2 initiative. So, so this Open Badges standard that we just launched back in November, um, all of the companies were really at the table around what that standard's going to mean and how do we do interoperability um, in that. And since that really forms the components of the comprehensive learning record, um, they're related. The group that really has been most um, involved that I've seen is we're seeing ACRO, which is the registrars group, and NASPA, which is the student affairs group, have come together. They have a, a, they've had two large Lumina grants, and what they're looking at is trying to understand 
how we can show the full record of student achievement that would be there. And so that is really more being driving, that's driving the CLR than the corporate side of things. And that's probably good because frankly it should be our registrars and student affairs professionals and others who are trying to drive what we want to think about in the comprehensive learning records. Um, we'll just be able to consume whatever is getting produced um, as long as it's open badges V2. Anything else? Yes. Um, I was wondering about the data lakes. Uh huh. I was wondering, um, do, do you or the university have plans to share either the methods to build these lakes, or um, maybe even possibly some of the data? So the data is probably a problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we, 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 we've been debate, you know, but no, that would be the, an interesting thing. I mean, there's, there's a group called Unison, which has come together with a, about 12 or 15 schools, and they're building a common data lake. Um, Vince's dream for the University of California system is to build a common data lake. I'm having conversations in the University System of Maryland to be saying maybe we because we have a, a, a mechanism where we could easily share data. We report to one board of regents. You could be thinking through that there's a sharing capability. We want to look at this. But looking across many different universities, probably hard for sharing the actual data. Related to how we're doing this, most definitely. At, at Learning Impact, which is the IMS um, conference in May, um, we're going to be having sessions on um, what we're doing in terms of the Learning Record Store. We think that um, in the past, people have been standing it up in ways which is much more complex. What I expect you'll also see is what we're doing there's going to be vendors that are starting to come out because it just makes perfect sense. If you're used to working in an AWS world, this is the way to go. But yes, we're going to be sharing what we're doing. Vince is at UCSD is going to be sharing what they're doing in Google Cloud Platform. Um, and so what we want to do is, is show that it's a lot easier to be doing this than um, people usually thought it was. And so that might help spur more development of setting up the data lakes in this environment. Anything else? I know. Oh, yes. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of, and it makes good sense that there's sort of an undergraduate focus to this. But if you're going to be talking about lifelong learning, you're going to move into graduate school, you're going to move into edX. learning that look different than content delivery, even if it's data enriched and analyzed and personalized. Um, there's a large effort going on about reproducibility, about uh, live re reproducible uh, document stacks where mm -hmm. you can actually write research papers where the data is available, the code is available, and people can actually do the research and verify the research in, in a distributed way. So it's a little bit richer right. content in that sense. Have you sort of dipped into that sphere? So are you referring somewhat to like Jupyter Notebooks or some of those Jupyter kinds of tools? Well, yeah. One tool in that there, model. There, there was a, there's, you know, there, there's reproducible document stack is a project that's okay. trying to make a full open source uh, computationally reproducible research platform. Mm -hmm. So some of it is the documents themselves. Jupyter Notebooks is one part of that, mm -hmm. but uh, Docker containers is another. There's a number of open source technologies that have to do with if I want to do reproducible research. And I know that research looks different from, from some of what you're doing, but it's, it's an reproducibility is a really important priority for the NSF and, and a lot of the science investments. And, uh, so, so it's the more of a graduate, it's sort of the next step. So the um, the piece in IMS, just sort of as we're thinking about it, is it's made up of members. So our members are higher ed and K through 12 with suppliers. We can propose anything we want to try to propose as a standards model. And, and a lot of these things take, you know, the, the comprehensive learning record started about four or five years ago. I think some of these, pro, what, what you're sort of hearing from me is, I think what you're highlighting is one of those areas where if at some point standards are going to be important because you need to be able to go from this open document stack to Jupyter Notebook and somehow you should be able to consume it in either way and have a, a portability mechanism between there, that might be a spot where the right standards would be in or there might be some other spot. That's a spot where IMS can sort of be a, a, an area where it can come to the table. There's other groups like IEEE, you know, that can also do these sorts of things and so we tend to work with 
um, with whatever groups where we're trying to drive it is we see our sweet spot is in the uh, teaching and learning space sure. and through that. But that's a great question, you know, into there. Because anything else? Well, thank you all. I really appreciate you letting me come and talk about this. <laughs>